message this morning I've entitled True Freedom. Before I get to the message, I want to pray. Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning. Father, we say that we are here not by accident, but on purpose. Father, we ask that your words will cause excitement in us, Father, that your word will bring true freedom, Father. And Father, we ask that the meditation of our hearts and the words of my mouth, that they would be acceptable, pleasing, and glorifying unto you. And we give you all honor and all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And, and the worship was awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Amen. I really, really just wanted to continue in it. It was that good. It was just fantastic. Today I'm taking the message from uh, Acts chapter 22, verses 25 through 28. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said to him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yes. And the chief captain answered, With a great son obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was born free, or I was free born. Now, as an American and being born here, I too was born free, okay? Born into freedom, protected by the laws of this land. And you, as an American citizen, you are free, amen? amen. Protected by the Constitution. But you have to know that freedom isn't free. Freedom has a cost. The Roman centurion knew this. He knew the price of freedom. He fought many battles, maintained his allegiance to Rome and to Caesar, paid a huge sum of money and a tribute to gain his freedom. He counted the cost, and he thought it was worth it. Our country, the U.S., was brought forth by a document known as the Declaration of Independence. 56 men came together and they put everything on the line for freedom. So I want to share a little bit about what these 56 men went through. Of the 56 men, five were captured by the British and they were tortured before they died. Because you see, freedom is not free. Twelve had their homes ransacked and burned. Two of them lost their sons in battle. Another two sons were captured. Nine of the 56 fought and died from wounds from the hardship of that war. Richard Stockton was a New York, Jersey State Supreme Court justice. The British troops pulled him from his bed one night, beat him, threw him into jail, where he almost starved to death. When he finally was released, he went home to find out that his estate had been looted, his possessions burned, his horses were stolen. He had been treated so badly in the prison that his health was ruined, and he died before the end of the, world, the war. His surviving family, who had once been rich, had to live on charity. Carter Braxton of Virginia was a wealthy planner and a trader, and he saw his ships sunk by the British Navy. He sold his home and his properties to pay his debts, and he died in poverty. At the Battle of Yorktown, the British general 
Cornwallis had taken over Thomas Nelson's home. He took it for his headquarters. Nelson quietly ordered George Washington to open fire on his home. And a home was destroyed, and Nelson died bankrupt. John Hart was at his wife's bedside, and she was dying. They had 13 children who fled. His fields were destroyed. In over a year, he lived in caves. He lives in fields. He lived in forest. When he finally returned home, his wife had died. His children had vanished. And again, he lost everything for what we know today as freedom. The birth of our nation, it wasn't easy. It came about after much hardship and much bloodshed. The cry went forth and men answered, whether voluntarily or some of them weren't so voluntary, they were pulled into it, but they went and they kept us free. And along this journey, there were many slogans to kind of like, you know, encourage people. World War II, it was remember Pearl Harbor. The Spanish-American War, remember the Maine. Uh, in the war between the Republic of Texas and Santa Ana of Mexico, it was, remember, the Alamo. After the 2001 attacks, it was, united we stand, and God bless America. World War I, it was, together we win. But I want you to know what the slogan was for the fight for this country's independence. It was, no king but Jesus. So if anyone tells you that this is not a Christian nation, they are lying. Because the very foundations of our nation were on Christ Jesus. No king but Jesus. No king but Jesus. Our founding fathers thought it was so precious that they gave up land, possessions, family, their lives, their freedom for our nation. And when you think about this, and you think about freedom, there's always a cost. Like this Roman centurion said, I paid so much, and I even gave all for my freedom, but yet I am free. Amen? Amen. And we stand here today as people who are saved by the blood of Christ, Free, amen? Free from sin. Free from the effects of sin. But it had a cost. And that was the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. So many times we get caught up in our mind and we don't realize the freedom that we have. And I, I shared this morning, and I want to share it again, this mindset, which I'm going to call circus elephant. And so many of us have a circus element or elephant mindset, okay? If you've ever been to the circus, and outside of the circus, they usually have an elephant. And these are like big elephants, okay? <laughs> Weighing over 8,000 pounds. And you'll see this elephant, and you'll see a little tiny chain around his leg. And you'll see a little post stuck into the ground. Now, honestly, do you think you can hold an 8,000-pound elephant with that little tiny chain? No. No, there's no way. But in his mind, he's already defeated. In his mind, he's a prisoner. In his mind, he's a captive. When this elephant was really small, and they first captured it and brought it to the circus. And we're, we're talking like a baby elephant, okay? They put that chain around that elephant's leg, and they tied it to the ground. And every time that little elephant went to move, that chain dug into his leg. And that elephant struggled to get free, and that chain held that elephant. And he struggled, and the more he struggled, the worse it hurt, until finally he said, I can never be free from this. I just have to live with it. I just have to accept it. 
I want you to think of those things which have kept you captive. Those things in your life which you have accepted. Those things which have kept you bound. Those things that have kept you from your destiny. Because I'm telling you that Christ has a destiny for you. Christ has a plan for your life. Before the very foundations of the earth, he knew your name. Before you were born, he knew your name. Before you came into the reality of this world, he knew exactly who you were. And he had a plan for your life. And he had a destiny for your life. And it was great things that he has in mind for you. But then you become captive. And like this elephant, you're afraid. You're afraid to pull because you remember the pain. You remember the pain of that chain against your leg. And just when you think you're going to get free from it, the devil comes around. And he'll bring a situation or he'll bring a circumstance into your life. And you remember that chain. And you remember that bondage. But I'm here to tell you this morning that Christ has set you free. It's already done. Hallelujah. Do you believe me? It's already done. Amen. God is so good. Hallelujah. He's paid the price. The word stronghold is a mindset. It's a mindset impregnated with helplessness, hopelessness, anxiety, insecurity, discouragement, loneliness, all of these things in that word stronghold. But the word freedom, or the word free, is enjoying personal rights, liberty as a person who is not in slavery, liberty as a person who is not chained down to the ground, by those strongholds. Amen? John 8, 36 says, If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, then you are free indeed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Christ has set you free. Without a doubt, you are free. Amen? Amen. Acts 12, 1 through 11. And when I read this, I never looked at this scripture this way. Acts 12, 1 through 11. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had appeared to him, he put him in prison. And he delivered him to the four quaternions of soldiers. That's like a whole group of soldiers to keep him. Intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Because it pleased the people when he killed James, okay? So Peter, therefore, was kept in prison. But prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. When Herod would have him bring forth, the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. So Peter is in prison. He's chained. He's between guards. He's deep in the prison. And lo, behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him. A light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on his side. And he raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. The angel said unto him, Gird thyself, bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. So he went out, followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but he thought he'd seen a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came to the iron gate that led to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out, and they passed on through the street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Now, verse 11. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, 
Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent this angel and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod from all expectation of the people of the Jews. Do you see? Peter was in jail. The angel came, broke the chains off of him, said, grab your garment, follow me. But Peter in his mind was still in bondage. They went through the prison because he was deep in the prison. Now, mind you, he's sleeping between two guards, okay? He gets out of that situation, he's going through the prison, and he doesn't fully understand that he's been delivered, that he's free. He gets to the gate. The gate opens for him. And finally, he comes to himself, and he realizes that he's free. Somebody here today is going to come to themselves and realize the freedom that Christ has given them. Amen? Amen. Peter came to himself. And you know, there's times in our lives when we have to come to ourselves. There's times in our life when the pressure of the enemy is so great that we think we're defeated. But I'm telling you, Christ has set you free. You must come to yourself. You must not believe the lies of the enemy. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So how do we renew our mind? A mind that is trapped, a mind that is bound. First of all, we have to know and realize, just like Peter did, that we are free, that Christ has freed us. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So how do you see yourself? I shared this morning, and I'm going to share it again briefly, a story that happened to me personally. I was going over to Cameroon. And I left from Chicago, and I think we stopped at New York. So anyway, I'm on the airplane, and you know it's a long flight, so I fell asleep. And when I woke up, I didn't feel good at all. I mean, I was perspiring. I felt like I was going to pass out. So I called for the stewardess to tell her, and as I stood up, I actually I passed out. Now, the stewardess called for a doctor, because there's always doctors on planes of that size, and the doctor came and took my blood pressure. And about that time, I kind of started to wake up, you know, and become aware of the situation. And the high number was in the 20s, okay? And the doctor said, we're going to have to stop. We're going to stop at, I think it was Greenland or something like that, for emergency. And I happened to think, you know, God sent me to Cameroon. What's going on? Didn't you send me, God? And so I started to pray. And God told me something I'll never forget. And I mean, I was sick, okay? I'd passed out, my blood pressure in the 20s. And God said, it's a lie. What you're feeling in your body is a lie. It's a lie. Get up. It's a lie. Go forward. It's a lie. Complete your destiny. Amen? Amen? So I started to set up, and the doctor's like, no, 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 you know, lay down. And I'm like, no, I've got to go to Cameroon. God has a plan for me there in Cameroon. And she said, okay, we're going to sit here, and I'm going to sit next to you. And she sat next to me on the plane, okay? She took my blood pressure again. God returned it to normal. <laughs> Hallelujah. I went on to Cameroon. And during that trip, God opened a Bible college, which is now the second biggest Bible college in Cameroon. This Bible college opened a radio station. They do deliverance on site. They have their own campus. While I was there, God healed a man who had been lame for 27 years, did not walk, and that man walked. Yeah. 
You have to know if God says you're free, that you're free. You have to know if God says you're healed, you're healed. Regardless of what you feel in your body, regardless of what your mind is telling you, if God says you're free, you're free. If God gives you a vision and God speaks it to you and you don't start to see it and it's not coming forth and you start to get discouraged and you start to see all these things in the natural holding you back, believe God because he is greater. Believe God because he is mighty. Believe God because with him, Nothing is impossible. Amen? Amen? I've seen time and time again in my life that God will fight for me. And God is no respecter of persons. If he's going to fight for me, he's going to fight for you. Do you believe it? Yes. Amen. God has a plan, and he wants to see it go forth in your life. And why? Because it's a plan to defeat the devil. And you know what? The devil isn't just going to lay down and say, okay, defeat me, okay? He's going to fight you, okay? He's going to make it seem real. He's going to make you discouraged. But you have to know in your mind that God has victory for you. Amen? Amen. I love last week's message on speaking life because that's my second point here. Speak life. Speak life. All the way through the scriptures, again and again, we see the power of the tongue. Don't speak the problem, speak the solution. Amen? Yes. Proverbs 15.4 says, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. Proverbs 18.21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. So guess what? Speak life. It's simple. If death and life are in the power of the tongue, speak life. Speak life into the situation. Speak life into your finances. Speak life into your health. Amen? Amen. Point number three. You have to make a decision to stay free. Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You have to make a decision to stay free. You cannot blame other people. You cannot blame circumstances. It's all up to you. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. It's up to you. You have to decide that you're going to be free. I think about the Jewish people when they were coming out of bondage in Egypt. And here they were in Egypt, and they're making bricks without straw, okay? Life was hard. It was terrible. It was awful. Moses came, God freed them, they get to the Red Sea, they have a little bit of a challenge, and they're like, let's go back to Egypt, okay, <laughs> let's go back there, and how many times in our life do we do that? How many times in our mind do we allow ourselves to be trapped again? You have to decide, stay free, stay free. I want to share a brief story, and it's a true story. And I was like, when I read this, I was like, wow, really? Okay, this is a story about uh, Duke Reynold III. Reynold lived this life of indulgence, and he was really obese, okay? In fact, his nickname was Crassus, which means fat, okay? So one day, Reynold and his younger brother, Edward, got into this great big fight. Now, I'll remind you, it's a true story, okay? They got in this great big fight. So his brother decides, I have a plan. I know what I'm going to do. So he takes his older brother, 
He puts him into custody, and he says, I'm not going to take his life. Okay. He decides to build a room around him. So he builds this room around him. Now, there's no doors. There's no barricades. And for a normal-sized person, you could get in and out. Okay. All he had to do was lose weight. Okay. But his brother had a plan. Every day, he brought all of these wonderful things for him to eat. And instead of being free, he allowed himself to be in bondage to that food. And eventually, his brother died. And because he was so overweight, he died. And he never was free. You have to decide to be free. You have to decide to remain free. The next point, stay in the word of God. Stay in the word of God because his word is life. And I said this morning and it's true. You got a problem? Look in the word. You wonder what to do? Look in the word. Everything's there. It's like our instruction manual. It's all there in the word of God. Life in the word. Living by the word makes you free. Because you know that people that are engaged in sin are not free. They look at Christians and they say, oh, how can you, like, deprive yourself of this and that? And you're not really free. I'm free. I can do whatever I want. But whatever it is, it has a hold on them. If they're smoking, that has a hold on them. If they're doing drugs, those drugs have a hold on them. If they're drinking, that alcohol has a hold on them, and they're not free. They're actually in bondage. If you have a question, what do I do? Read the word. Read the word. Because Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and it shall make you free. Not it might make you free, but it shall make you free. The last point. We win by using spiritual weapons. 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5 tells us, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, again, that mentality that keeps telling you that you're captured, okay, casting it down, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity Every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. We win not by natural weapons, but by using spiritual weapons. These spiritual weapons, prayer, fasting, reading the word, faith. Let faith rise up in you. These are our weapons. These are the weapons of our warfare. These are the weapons we use to defeat the enemy and achieve everything God has for us. And remember again, Paul said in Acts twenty two twenty eight, 28, but I was reborn. And you as a Christian have been born again, and you are free. Amen? Amen. Father, I just want to say thank you. Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for the freedom that you bought for us on Calvary. And Father, God, my, pray, my prayer is this morning that we would all know the freedom that we have. That that bondage that we've been trapped in will fall off and we will realize that we are free. That the enemy cannot deceive us again. That we will do all that you have called us to do. And we will remain free in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.